Let's get started right off with a friend of mine who's in here from England. His name is John Davis. John was a pioneer of vegetarianism on the internet from the earliest days. I think starting in 1994, he was building uh, major English and European vegetarian websites. He uh, is the manager, the manager of the International Vegetarian Union, IVU, and in that capacity, he helps to arrange and participates in activities geared towards assisting vegetarian organizations around the world with a particular emphasis in emerging nations in Africa and China and Asia. He is a wealth of information about vegetarian, vegetarianism through the ages and uh, probably knows more than just about anybody uh, I know about the near and distant past who were plant-based. He's got a great English accent. And uh, please help me welcome straight from Downton Abbey, my friend, John Davis. This is going to be a very quick history tour. Um, and all the people who come in late, I should be reminding them regularly, the most important slide in this whole talk is the first one. And they will have missed it. So let's see if we can go on now. The reason I'm starting in 19, in, sorry, 1806, that's the first very clear, unambiguous statement we get about veganism. And this is Dr. William Lamb, who was practicing in London at the time. 1806, he changed his diet to take out all animal products completely. A few years later, he wrote a book, and in that he said, as he got up there, uh, my reason for objecting to every species of matter to be used as food except the direct produce of the earth is founded on the broad ground that no other matter is suited to the organs of man. This applies then with the same force to eggs, milk, cheese and fish as to flesh meat. That's a pretty clear statement of a plant food diet. And he wrote that, I think 1809, his first book came out. The photograph <coughs> was taken uh, when he was 82. He changed his diet when he was 40. And you can imagine in the first half of the 19th century how difficult it was to follow this diet. Margarine hadn't been invented. Uh, soy was unknown in the West. They were very limited. But he still lived to be 82, very fit and healthy throughout that time. Now, moving on. Uh, one of his patients was a man called John Frank Newton, who also adopted the same diet and wrote a book about it. Newton added uh, some of the ethical aspects about treatment of animals. I'm not going to read all that because I haven't really got time, but you can see it. Um, William Lamb probably had ethical values as well, but we don't know because his books were all just medical. So, going on again, how many of you have heard of Percy Bysshe Shelley? Well, a few, a few. Okay. Shelley was a very famous poet, or famous if you've heard of him. Um, Shelley met Newton and changed his diet, along with a bunch of others. And they had for a while in 1813, there were a whole bunch of them living in a country house, effectively a vegan commune. Uh, they were trying very hard to be vegan, or what we now call vegan. The word wasn't there then. Um, and as you can see from that, um, in the middle of it, cheese was under the ban. Uh, milk and cream might not be taken unreservedly. However, they were allowed in puddings and to be poured sparingly into tea as an indulgence to the neophytes. A neophyte being someone who's new to it all. And I'm sure you can all remember how difficult it was giving up milk. Uh, they were struggling, but they tried. They knew what they were trying to do. Uh, soon after that, we start getting transatlantic communications. So I'll put up some British and American flags for the next few slides so you can see what I'm talking about. Um, Dr. William Lamb in London was in contact with Sylvester Graham in Boston. Now, some of you might have heard of Sylvester Graham. Uh, meanwhile, a man called James Pierpont Greaves, who I'll come back to in a minute, in London, was 
in contact with Bronson Alcott, also in Boston. Uh, most Americans know about Bronson Alcott because of his daughter, Louisa May Alcott. Um, and Bronson was a very important character in his own right, and I'll come back to him later as well. So this is Sylvester Graham, uh, originally a Presbyterian minister. He adopted what they were then calling the vegetable diet. Um, and he started out, like most others, saying, well, yeah, eggs and dairy, okay. But then he changed his mind. And by 1839, he wrote in his book, uh, though they do better on a milk and vegetable diet than one of flesh and vegetables, yet they do best when they confine themselves to a diet of pure vegetable food and pure water. And this is straight out of William Lamb's book, the communication across the Atlantic taking place here. So, go on again. This is Dr. John Snow back in England. Anyway, it says at the top, Dr. John Snow was voted in a poll of British doctors in 2003 as the greatest physician of all time. And very few of those British doctors who voted for him would have known that he was also what we now call vegan. Uh, he'd adopted the diet through reading Newton's book and coming into contact with Lamb's ideas. Uh, the reason John Snow was famous, uh, he was the one who discovered the cause of cholera. Uh, which was a huge breakthrough. Uh, the doctors at the time all said it's something in the air. Um, Snow said it's in the water, the drinking water. And this came from William Lamb's argument about pure water. You can imagine what the drinking water in London was like in the early 19th century. Um, <coughs> and he virtually invented the science of epidemiology in the process. So he's a hugely important figure. Uh, we go on again now. This is the important part, Olcott House. Um, James Pierpont Greaves, who I mentioned earlier, was an educator. He wanted to start a school. And he was given some books about Bronson Olcott School in Boston. So Greaves wrote to Olcott what he didn't know, because communications in those days, you can imagine how long it took a letter to get across the Atlantic, um, Olcott School had already closed. So Alcott didn't reply, but Greaves went ahead. 1838, he opened his school near London, and because he was so impressed with the books about Alcott, he called it Alcott House. And this was a, a boarding school. The 1841 census shows something like 23 children and three teachers. Later on, it changed and became more of an adult community. Um, about uh, just over two years ago, a group of us, including some friends at uh, Harvard and Berkeley University, decided that we could finally work out where the word vegetarian came from. There have been arguments for 150 years about this. The big difference now is that Google has scanned 10 million old books. And whereas in the past you'd have to go to a huge library, look through every page of every book to find the word vegetarian, now you just put vegetarian before 1847, which is the crucial date, and up they all come. And allowing for scanning errors, what we showed, without any doubt at all, was that every use of the word vegetarian before 1847 came from people very closely connected with Alcott House. Before that, it was known as the vegetable diet, and everywhere else it was known as the vegetable diet. These were the people who started to call themselves vegetarians. And we then, we got a bit of a surprise, really. When we looked at it more, we get what it says up there. Neither milk, butter, cheese, eggs, nor any species of flesh meat, nor animal food, neither tea, coffee, nor any of those artificial stimulants do the Concordists partake of or supply to others. Concordists, they changed the name after a while to the Concordia. This is because Bronson Alcott's hometown, Concord, Massachusetts. It was going back to that. And it was a sort of thing about harmony. Um, so this was, in every sense, what we now call vegan, and not just the food. They made it very clear they objected to any use of animals for anything at all. So they were ethical vegans in every sense. So the first people who called themselves vegetarian used the word to mean exactly what it looks like. Vegetables, vegetation, nothing else. 
And some of us are trying to get the word back to what it originally meant. Uh, if you go to vegsource.com, you've all seen vegsource.com, you wouldn't be here otherwise. Uh, right at the top it says, your resource for all things vegetarian. You won't find anything on there saying, eat more cheese. So Jeff is using the word for what it really means. Um, so all of this came as a surprise. Um, uh, it all, I wrote it up and it's gone all around the world since then. Uh, so moving on a bit, this is Bronson Alcott. He came over to London in uh, 1842, stayed there a few months, went back to Boston and founded Fruitlands. You may have heard of Fruitlands. This was a, a completely vegan community. It didn't last long. It's mostly famous because of uh, Bronson's 10-year-old daughter, Louisa May, who was living there at the time. Um, I'm going to move on quickly. Uh, Henry David Thoreau, I'm sure you've all heard of him, friend of all cops. Um, he was, he was never completely vegan, but he was experimenting with it. And while he was living in his hut, he specifically says he cut out butter and milk, as well as the animal foods. He sort of varied over the years. Um, now, we go back to England. Uh, there was a spin-off from Alcott House called Northwood Villa, which was a hydrotherapy institute, water cure treatment, which had come over from Germany. Um, we've now shown that this was also completely what we now call vegan. They took over editing the, uh, the Alcott House Journal and called it the Truth Tester. And in early 1847, uh, one of the readers wrote to this journal saying, why don't we start a vegetarian society? The word had been around for uh, since about 1840. So they arranged a meeting. The problem was that Olcott House at this point was running out of money. They were struggling. But there were some others who I think, yeah, they'll come up. There was another group in the north of England near Manchester called the Bible Christian Church. Um, they also followed what they called the vegetable diet. But their version of the vegetable diet was based on the promised land flowing with milk and honey and eggs. And they had a very wealthy businessman, they had a member of parliament, they had money, they had influence. So the Alcott House lot, who were struggling, joined up with them and formed the Vegetarian Society, which left the obvious problem. So they set the objects of the society down there as no, I haven't got a pointer. The objects of the society are to induce habits of abstinence from the flesh of animals as food. And only the flesh. Nothing about milk or eggs. So you can see the problem. The meaning of the word vegetarian is now changing because of the vegetarian society. Uh, it caused confusion right through the second half of the 19th century. Uh, there were always a large group of people who did not use any animal product at all and called themselves vegetarian. But there were even more who did use eggs and dairy and also called themselves vegetarian. The society tried to change its name at one point in the 1870s. Um, they tried the Dietetic Reform Society, uh, the Vegetable Egg and Milk Society, all sorts of things. But they knew they were not really vegetarians. They knew it was wrong, but they couldn't get around it. In the end, some of you might have heard the word vegetus. And there's a really silly fiction, which we've also disproved, about the word vegetarian being derived from vegetus, which means whole, fresh and lively, and it's got nothing to do with eggs and dairy. Um, that was invented in the 1880s to get round this problem of the wrong name. So they carried on calling it the Vegetarian Society. Um, meanwhile, over in New York, Russell Troll, uh, was running another one of these hydrotherapy institutes. It had moved across the Atlantic by this time. Uh, his originally, he was producing a cookbook which had eggs and dairy in it. He went the other way, uh, changed in 1862, and in 1874 he published what, as far as we know, the first ever vegan cookbook. So the Americans got there first. 
Um, and John Harvey Kellogg, you've all heard of him. Um, Kellogg, uh, Seventh Day Adventist, the Battle Creek Sanitarium, and of course he and his brother went on to make the cornflakes. Kellogg's books, and well, there are about 40 of them, all use certainly uh, yogurt, or yogurt as you call it, um, to lacto-vegetarian. Kellogg himself privately cut out all of that. And he was at least in dietary terms vegan for about 40 years. Uh, eventually he went back to uh, a certain amount of dairy and then he discovered soy milk by the 1920s. This was just getting known in the West. If he discovered soy milk earlier then maybe everyone around the world will be eating cornflakes with soy milk instead of cow's milk. It would have made a difference. Um, this is the first British vegan cookbook in 1910. Um, but again, there's a lot of transatlantic connections there. It was uh, published in America as well. But it wasn't called vegan. It was just called no animal food, plant food. And we've actually got at the bottom there, New York Times, November 6, 1910, Dr. Lee pleads for better foods, and he used the phrase plant foods. As far as I can find, that is the first ever use of that phrase, plant foods. And again, it's the Americans. And what the Americans do, and what you always do, is shift from the negative to the positive. So instead of saying, we don't eat this and we don't eat that, you talk about what you do eat. And we're trying to promote that thinking around the rest of the world as well. So we eat a plant food diet. Um, Mohandas Gandhi, you've all heard of him. Um, he was uh, originally followed the traditional Hindu diet. When he went to London about 1890s as a student, his mother made him take a vow not to eat meat while he was in London. It was a religious vow. So he struggled with it. Uh, then when he was there, he found a vegetarian restaurant, but he also found a book by Henry Salt called A Plea for Vegetarianism. At this point, Gandhi had never heard of vegetarianism. He was just a Hindu, and he ate a Hindu diet. Um, but he read this book and decided that this was a good idea in its own right, not just because of his religion. Uh, so he changed, and he then took it to the next step because Henry Salt was also saying that milk is not necessary. And for the 1890s, this was going against the majority. Gandhi actually gave up milk drinking completely for about six years when he was in South Africa. Got back to India, he was ill. The doctors all said to him, you know, he's India, you have to drink milk. Uh, he still, he kept to his vow, but his vow was not to drink cow's milk. So he compromised and took goat's milk. Uh, in India, that is a big deal. Uh, he's very different. Um, but he always, in uh, 1831, he came to London, spoke to the Vegetarian Society, and he very clearly stated that he saw milk drinking as the tragedy of my life, he put it. Um, we could never quite get away from it. But he also, by the 1930s, had discovered soy milk and started experimenting with it, but there wasn't much of it around then. Um, then the next step, the inevitable. Um, 1944, this is during the Second World War, which is quite extraordinary. Uh, there were an increasing number of members of the Vegetarian Society who were unhappy with the Vegetarian Society's use of eggs and dairy products. Uh, they were calling themselves non-dairy vegetarians. Uh, but that included no eggs as well. Um, they wanted to form a separate section within the society and they have their own page in the magazine for the non-dairy people. Given that the definition was always with or without eggs and dairy, well, there are always a lot following the without version. The society's uh, council said, no, can't do that, that would be too divisive. It got more divisive, inevitably. And they started another society. And they took the beginning and the end of the word vegetarian and invented the word vegan. And it is pronounced vegan, not whatever other kind of pronunciation other people might come up with. 
Um, but they maintained their close connection with the vegetarian society. Donald Watson, who was the uh, main instigator of this, um, kept his membership of the vegetarian society for life. He um, he had gone what we what was now called vegan in about 1942. He lived to be 95. He died, I think, 2005, age 95. So didn't do him any harm. Um, the photograph there, almost as soon as the Vegan Society was founded, they joined the International Vegetarian Union. And they had no problem with that. They were part of the vegetarian movement. And you do get vegans today, we're not vegetarians, we're not having anything to do with that. Vegans are something different. Well, no, you're not. Vegans are part of the vegetarian movement and always have been. And vegetarian has always been with or without eggs and dairy. Um, and then we get, of course, the Americans are not going to be left behind on this. By 1948, there was a vegan society in California. Uh, 1960, it uh, joined us, uh, Jay Dinshaw, who founded the American Vegan Society, still active today. Uh, that has also been a member of the International Vegetarian Union from the day it started in 1960. Um, they kind of went the other way. 1974, J. Dinshaw founded the North American Vegetarian Society, quite deliberately to make it sound more inclusive, bring in more people. And they used that to promote the first ever IVU Congress in North America in 1975. They got one and a half thousand people for a, two weeks in, uh, up in Maine, which in 1975, that's a lot of people, did an amazing job with that. Um, vegans and IVU. Uh, that's uh, the top photograph is the 1957 IVU Congress in India. I should explain IVU, the International Vegetarian Union, was founded in 1908, so we're we're 104 years old now, and we've been organising these congresses every two or three years. I say we, not me personally. Even I'm not that old. Um, but every two or three years, there's a congress moving around the world. Uh, 1957, the congress was in India, and that photograph is the Indian Vegan Society. So they got one too. Considering the word was only invented in 1944, we've now got vegan societies in America and India. Um, and below that, the 1977 congress, the general secretary of IVU uh, was a prominent member of the Vegan Society. So IVU is kind of catching up with all this. Uh, and this one, IVU goes vegan. Well, yes, we are still called the International Vegetarian Union. We have no intention at all of changing the name. Uh, for the last 15 years, we have insisted that any event that we support, all the food must be totally plant food. No eggs, no dairy. So if you take the definition of vegetarian as with or without eggs, dairy, we only promote the without version. We try to be inclusive. We accept any type of vegetarian members, but we will not promote anything other than plant food. Um, and we now have 22 vegan societies around the world, which are members of IVU. Um, and 114 in our database, organisations using the word vegan in their title. And most organisations around the world which call themselves vegetarian are doing what IVU is doing and promoting plant food only. The original meaning of the word vegetarian. Now, to be fair, most individuals who call themselves vegetarian have no idea what it means. A lot of them eat fish, they'll eat chicken, they'll, you know, they'll only eat red meat on Thursdays and they call themselves vegetarian. Very frustrating. But the organisations, with one or two notable exceptions, uh, the organisations are promoting the plant food only version of vegetarian. Um, this is just an interesting little graph from Google. Um, the red line is searches for the word vegan over the last few years. I can't see that. 2004. 
Right, so the last eight years searches for the word vegan. The blue line is searches for the word vegetarian. And you can see what's happening. California is ahead of the world, as always. Um, California, there are now more searches for vegan than vegetarian. Uh, so on the, somewhere on the East Coast, it's about level. On the rest of the world, they're still looking for vegetarian, but they're catching up. Um, so California is, is way out there, showing the way. Um, and that's the last one. Oh, look at that. I've got a few minutes spare. Now, if you want to know more about all this history, um, go to ivu.org, if you can see that. IVU is internationalvegetarianunion.org. And down the left-hand side, you'll see a button that says History. Uh, and you click on that, and you'll see one for History of Veganism. Uh, there's a collection of articles I've been writing over the last two and a half years. And there's also a link to an e-book. Uh, and you can download the whole book completely free, about 200 pages, The History of Veganism, all of this in much more detail than I've given here. So do go and have a look. Lots of it about America and about the rest of the world, all sorts of things going on. So I'm going to stop. Thank you very much.